Updated December 2, 2017 164,944 when an 11-year-old Perth boy was arrested over a fatal mob attack in Perth City Centre last year, he became one of the youngest, if not the youngest, person to ever be charged with murder in Australia. It left many in the community questioning how could such a young boy be implicated in such a heinous crime. Why was a boy of primary school age roaming the city streets with a violent mob in the early hours of the morning? Where were his parents and why wasn't he at home, safe with his family, like the thousands of other children who hours earlier had enjoyed the Australia Day fireworks? The unfortunate reality is that this child, as is the case with countless others, never stood a chance of having what most people in modern-day Australia might consider a normal life. Where did this child come from? The boy is one of the younger children from a large family from Perth's southern suburbs. At the time of his arrest, he was not regularly attending school and it was reported his upbringing was marred by domestic violence and the family moving between relatives' houses. At the age of five, he had witnessed one of his brothers being run over while he was crossing the road, something that was said in court proceedings to have led to his family falling apart. His parents had long-standing problems with drug use and some of his older siblings had been in trouble with the law. He too was already in the criminal justice system. At the time of the fatal attack, the boy was on bail on a charge of aggravated robbery and supposed to be under the supervision of a responsible person. Instead, in the early hours of January 27, 2016, he was wandering the streets of Perth CBD with a group of young males and females in the aftermath of the Australia Day fireworks celebrations. Armed for a showdown for reasons that are not exactly clear, the group became involved in three separate violent fights in three different public locations with another group that included 26-year-old Patrick Slater. All involved had armed themselves with weapons, including Mr. Slater who had a machete. The eight members of the 11-year-old's group were seen carrying and throwing items including rocks, bottles, a metal bar socket, a star picket and a timber pole. Their movements were captured on CCTV cameras. They recorded Mr. Slater being chased by the eight men and boys up a set of stairs on the concourse of the Esplanade train station. But what the cameras did not capture was the 49 seconds during which Mr. Slater was stabbed in the chest with a screwdriver. Moments later, as Mr. Slater lay dying, the 11-year-old was recorded with the others fleeing the scene, carrying the screwdriver stained with Mr. Slater's blood. Eight children and young men charged down the weeks that followed, the 11-year-old and seven others ranging in age from 16 to 29 were charged with Mr. Slater's murder. The boy was remanded in juvenile detention and, despite several attempts, failed to get bail. The main bail problem was the failure of anybody in his life who could be considered a responsible person, as required under the Bail Act. The boy's court appearances were via video link from the Banksia Hill Detention Center, where he watched proceedings flanked by his parents who were with him for support. His then lawyer, Helen Prince, had argued her client could be released and placed in the care of his then 22-year-old brother, who owned the house where the boy, his parents and siblings had been living. The brother was studying full-time at TAFE, but a bail hearing was told he needed to find a job to pay the mortgage. The brother also admitted having six prior convictions for driving while under suspension and disqualification, and because of that was subject to a suspended prison term. The judge concluded because of the pressure on the man to find full-time work, he would not be able to properly supervise his brother and, in particular, make sure he went to school, something that would happen if he stayed in detention. The Slater Slayers convicted on July this year, six of his co-accused, dubbed the Patrick Slater Slayers by prosecutors, were found guilty by a Supreme Court jury of Mr. Slater's murder. Five were sentenced to life with minimum terms of between 12 and 18 years. A 17-year-old boy was sentenced to a finite jail term of 12 years. A seventh teenager, who was just 16 at the time, pleaded guilty to manslaughter and was sentenced to four and a half years in detention. The youngest boy was originally due to stand trial with his co-accused, but at the last minute his case was sent back to the children's court where, over the past two weeks, he has been on trial. At the start of proceedings the boy pleaded guilty to the lesser offence of manslaughter, but that was not accepted by prosecutor Sean Stocks, who argued the boy was one of the leaders in the fatal pursuit of Mr. Slater that night. The teenager's lawyer, Christopher Myasevich, said his client, as the smallest and the youngest of the group, was a follower, not a leader, and he highlighted a lack of evidence the boy had actually inflicted the fatal wound. 
Children's Court President Dennis Reynolds agreed, saying he was not satisfied there was proof the boy was even there at the time of the fatal stabbing. The boy has now spent 21 months in detention. In April, he celebrated his 13th birthday behind bars. As expected over the time, he is no longer the slightly built 11-year-old he was in January 2016. He has grown taller, his voice has deepened and he has signs of facial hair. He is yet to be sentenced, but after his manslaughter conviction he will unlikely spend much more time behind bars given his prior detention. On his eventual release, everyone involved in the case will hope he can become what lawyers term a productive member of the community. Topics Murder and Manslaughter, Law Crime and Justice, Community and Society, Family and Children, Children, Perth 6000, WA first posted December 2, 2017 092024.